Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. We uh, kind of overlapped on the last talk, so people can continue to filter in. Um, so my name is Bill Farner. Um, I've been a, an engineer on Aurora at Twitter for about five and a half years. Uh, we started the Aurora project at Twitter, uh, and it's grown and, and been hugely successful at Twitter. Uh, we, we now use it to deploy pretty much all production software at Twitter on top of our Mesos clusters. Uh, we operate some of the biggest Mesos clusters in the world, uh, and we stress them out pretty heavily. We have uh, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 engineers that are using Aurora almost every day to deploy software. Uh, so a quick bit of audience participation. How many of you here have used what you'd consider a deploy tool before? Really? That few? OK. Uh, now, how many of you have written a deploy tool before? It's interesting that that seems like more people, so I don't know how that works. <laughs> uh, so of, of those that, that just raised their hands about writing a deploy tool, how many of you found it to be simple? If there are any hands, I'd like to talk to you later so you can teach me something. So uh, what we found over, over the time spent uh, on Aurora is that, uh, for one, it, Aurora sort of transformed into a deploy engine uh, because ultimately that's one of the most important parts of the system. There's been a lot of focus in the Mes Mesos ecosystem and, uh, and a lot of the talks that you'll see about resource utilization and improving utilization. And uh, that's a really huge thing, and, uh, and there's obviously a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit for, for saving capital expenses on that. Uh, but I think one thing that hasn't really gotten enough discussion is uh, improving productivity. Uh, that, that's sort of an invisible cost to your organization, and deploy tooling can be a huge, huge impediment to, uh, to developer productivity and can actually uh, impede progress pretty significantly. Uh, so, some of the details about Aurora is that um, it's, it's, like I mentioned, we've got about 2,000 engineers that are using it on a daily basis. So it's, uh, it's very important that it's a multi-user system. Uh, so this is something that might be a little bit different from other frameworks that you see where um, this is sort of the entryway into production for uh, the majority of our engineers at Twitter. Um, and, and as a result, we've just spent a tremendous amount of time trying to make deploy both as, uh, as stable and as, uh, as useful um, as, as possible while trying to improve the efficiency of our engineers. Uh, so one of the problems with trying to generalize deployment is that there are actually very many meetings for it. Uh, and as I'll, I'll go into some more detail, Aurora has some different types of, of ways that you can launch things. So that adds to some of the use cases, but also uh, as we found with our, our hundreds of services that are running in production and, and, and experiments and um, and uh, integration test type things that are running in, in our data center, there's just, uh, there's no shortage of, of definitions that people have for what an update actually is and what, you know, what it means to ship code. Uh, so, there, and there's also just a huge variance in the sensitivity of things. Uh, so the, the term snowflake floats around quite a lot and uh, there, there's just a, a ton of different uh, types of ways that different applications are sensitive uh, during updates and, uh, and to, to capacity and various things like that. And also there's, there's just a, a wide array of, uh, of durations for, for updates. Uh, we have some jobs that will be updated in a matter of seconds and that's fine and uh, that's actually preferable. And then we have some that actually will, t will span days. So uh, when you think about the concept of, of doing a deployment, uh, sometimes that'll last a week for some teams. Uh, so this, this actually has a huge impact on the way that we design these, these uh, systems that are uh, that are both implementing the individual updates and the infrastructure that's around it. Uh, so the, the most general definition that I've been able to come up with for a deploy is uh, any change to the, the code parameters or the runtime of the service. So the code is obviously uh, the software that's actually being iterated on. The parameters might be command line arguments, environment variables, or uh, configuration files. Uh, and then the runtime would be like things like the CPU, uh, number of CPUs allocated, the amount of RAM, uh, things like that. So kind of just defining the shape of the, the resource slot that the, the uh, instances of the service fit into. And one of the most important things about uh, deploy for, for me and for my team to, uh, to really sell to our engineers is that uh, change is really, really good, and we want to make it as easy as possible, but it really isn't easy. Uh, and I'll go into some details on, on why that actually 
turns out to not be all that easy, at least in the general case. Uh, and some of the things that we've done to try to make it easier. But, uh, but ultimately, we want, we want to do as much as we can to encourage our engineers to be shipping their code as fast as possible. Uh, we, we want to encourage people to have production be as close to master as they can, because that, that reduces cognitive overhead, that makes it easier to debug things in production. Uh, if, you, if you watched uh, Joe Smith's talk on uh, sort of the, the, the realities of, of, uh, of our uses of Aurora and Mesos in production at Twitter, um, one of the things that he mentioned is that we, we kind of practice what we preach here. So we, uh, for Aurora and Mesos itself, for some of the major components, we're shipping as much as twice a week. Uh, so you know, the code that you get uh, from the, the ASF Git repos are like, pretty close to identical to what we're actually deploying. And we're deploying that very rapidly. And in many cases, that's saved us because we can very quickly say when something goes wrong, specifically what, what we need to fix, and we can focus on and, and iterate very quickly. And, and this, this just goes, uh, it has a lot to do with empowering developers. Um, when, when developers can deploy in minutes and you know, not have to think much about it, they're, um, they're not spending as much time building up code to, to do these giant deploys that uh, then have just a much higher rate of failure. So the key to a lot of this is just building up automation as much as possible. Uh, we, we really want to remove the developer from the critical path of doing deploy so that uh, the code is just sort of, there, there's a pipeline and things are just sort of automatically flowing or at least automatically prepared to go into production uh, because uh, that, that makes them uh, much more able to focus on actually iterating and building product. And uh, so, I want to just talk quickly about some of the design principles that we try to apply in building the tooling that I'm going to talk about. Um, it, in my opinion, it's really important that tools are safe but sharp and also predictable. So we, we've tried to sort of apply this test to tools, or at least I've tried to apply this, these tests to tools uh, so that we can either fix the ones that don't, don't pass these three principles uh, or remove them. And I'll talk about some that we've actually removed as a result of, the, of failing this test. Um, uh, so in, in, along with this, there's going to be a tendency over time, especially as people, you know, so the, the picture here is woodworking. Um, people in woodworking are, are cutting their hands relatively often, especially when you're first starting out. But the, the reaction is never to go and, and dull your tool. You don't take, take your chisel and apply a file to it to, to not cut yourself the next time you use it. Uh, you train yourself, uh, you learn better techniques, you figure out what safeguards you need to apply in order to not injure yourself in the future. Um, so this is kind of an odd image. So this is a stairwell. Um, there's something very specific about this stairwell, though. You'll notice that this is it's basically a multi-level stairwell that goes uh, from upper floors down into uh, a basement. Um, and there's, there's a book called Design of Everyday Things that if you haven't read, it's really awesome. And it talks about this and why this exists. And basically what this is, is um, it's, it's to naturally guide people that are trying to, to flee a building. Um, and before things like this existed, uh, there were problems where people would try to flee a building, in, in many cases in the, the event of a fire, and they would just naturally follow the path of least resistance, which was to, to just repeat what they'd been doing the whole time they were, they were descending the stairwell, not really paying attention to where they're going, uh, the fact that they're going into the basement. And there were issues where people would be trapped and, and um, in many cases injured or, uh, or God forbid, uh, actually perished. So the, the fix here was to install a gate. Uh, so what this gate does is it forces the, the, the fleeing person who is uh, almost always acting irrationally uh, to reassess what they're doing and and realize that okay this is this is a uh, there, there's something different about this particular level I need to think about what I'm doing and this, this is sort of a principle that we can apply with building tools uh, to make sure that the le the path of least resistance is the safe one uh, so what's special about this gate is it it helps the person that's acting irrationally in a, a state of panic um, the the downfall of it is that. In the normal case, where people actually legitimately need to go to the basement, um, it's, it's kind of an inconvenience. But the trade-off is, is considered valuable because it's better for people to be slightly inconvenienced in the normal path so that people that are uh, in a critical state 
and escape safely, then I'll be trapped. So, th so this is kind of just an example of uh, how I think it's, it's, it's good to think about this when you're building tools to make sure that the, the normal flow of things is a safe path and that you can't sort of blindly walk into a, a trap. Uh, so as for the mechanics of how updates actually work, there's a couple of pretty common strategies. Uh, so rolling update is the most uh, obvious one, and this is the one that Aurora implements for services. Uh, so you, you've probably seen this before, especially if you've ever used um, like uh, Capistrano-based deploys or anything like that, uh, where you're operating on a, a set of fixed machines. This is pr pretty much the, the, the most straightforward way to do it. Um, and there's a couple of, uh, of side effects of this that I want to point out. Uh, so let's say in this case we're talking about a service that has nine instances. So the, the blue boxes are going to be the, the current version of the software. And the way this update's going to work is first we're going to, we're going to remove one batch of the service. And usually the batch size is, is selected um, based on some information from the service owner on how much capacity they can deal without for, for some period of time. So we're going to have an instance of, of time in the course of this update where we have reduced capacity. We're down to six instances. And then we're going to go ahead and add the new instances, uh, same batch size. So we're back up to nine. And then we're kind of doing this, this staggered flow where we're removing the old instances, adding the new ones. Pretty straightforward. Um, but one of, the, one of the impacts of that, like I mentioned, is that you're kind of operating in a state of reduced capacity for the duration of the, the update. And in many cases, this is not an issue. In some cases, it is a pretty big issue. And it actually results in services having to make this trade-off between velocity of the update and, uh, and capacity planning, where if they want to update really fast, they might over-provision so that they can take out large batches and, and move faster. And that obviously has, uh, that has expenses that are associated with it. Uh, another, another paradigm that has come up, uh, especially with the, the advent of, of clouds, like uh, with AWS, is blue-green. Uh, Netflix will call this red-black, I think. Uh, so basically what this means is you have, you have your, your service running, and you're going to just create a full copy of it uh, with the new version of the software. And the important detail here is that there's a load balancer in play. So in, in some cases, you know, if your, your services are already fronted by a load balancer, this is, this is actually a pretty nice approach, especially if you're in something like AWS, where it's very cheap to just create a large pool of machines and, and, and use that sort of in an ephemeral way, uh, because then you can just cut over traffic to the, the new instances, keep the old ones around uh, until you're comfortable with the deploy, and, um, and then you're done. Uh, so the side effect here is, the, the deploy forward and rollback can actually be really, really fast. Um, however, so for sizes, uh, for service sizes of, of nine, this is not to, too bad, uh, even in, in clusters like we have at Twitter, um, where 18 instances is not really terribly expensive. Um, and however, we have cases at Twitter where we have services that are pretty dominant in, in the data center, so we actually might not have enough physical capacity in order to do a full copy of a service, especially when you start talking about things like rack diversity constraints, where we might not have enough physical racks to offer what they want. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, there, uh, you really can't approach this without both load balancers fronting your services and also integration with the deploy tooling to work with that load balancer. Uh, so, so this approach is something that we've started talking about recently. We don't implement it yet. Um, in Aurora, but uh, I think it's kind of intriguing, and I, and I wanted to talk about it briefly. So I'm calling this a sliding update. I don't know if there's a, a formal name for it, but uh, it's kind of somewhere in between rolling update and, uh, and blue-green, where rather than reducing capacity, we're actually going to add a batch of capacity before removing the, uh, the, the batch that we're replacing. And we're just going to sort of slide across the service, um, over-provisioning it for the duration of the update rather than under-provisioning it. Uh, so there's been some interest in this from some customers at Twitter um, who, you know, don't want to deal with the under-provisioning during the update, but, um, but still want to be able to update really quickly. So this could offer that. And 
to some extent, you can kind of implement the, the blue-green with this approach, especially with the, if you have the external integration with, uh, with load balancing. And uh, so the most naive one is uh, just stop-start. Um, and in some cases, this, uh, this is actually fine, where you, you, know, you basically just turn the lights off and turn it back on. Uh, some of you have probably done this on accident. Uh, it's, it's definitely happened at Twitter. Um, it's obviously pretty poor for availability. Uh, so you have some period of time where you have actually just no instances of your service live. Um, but um, you know, for things like experiments and internal tools, uh, sometimes the, the micro outage is preferable to waiting around to see the, the out outcome of the update. And then another feature that Aurora has that we wanted to support with job updates is cron jobs. Uh, so uh, with a cron job, what we have in Aurora is we have a, a template. So the, the template basically defines when we get to the, the, the cycle time of the, update, or the, uh, the cron schedule, we're going to instantiate that, that template uh, as an instance in the cluster. So we kind of have this, this sliding window over time where the, the template is defined, and then at some point, that template might change. Um, and this sometimes throws people, um, because it might be hard, hard to tell, but there's just a slight difference between the, that most recent instance starting up and the template changing. And we're not going to try to go back and, and alter the, the cron iteration that's already running, but it's basically going to affect uh, subsequent iterations. So, so yeah, the, 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 crons, the cron case is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're just replacing that template, uh, and that's how we do updates for crons in, uh, in Aurora. Um, so, so getting a little bit more metaphorical, um, you, you've, the, the term container has, has been thrown around a lot um, and has really been pretty good at, at capturing the way that we want to deploy applications and, and isolate them and treat them as, as uniform uh, units of, of, of work. Um, in, in the case of building uh, the deploy tooling in Aurora, uh, I, 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 can't, I can't help but feel like container doesn't really do the situation justice. So I feel like parcel is actually maybe a better term in this case, uh, because we have lots of things that might be labeled, handled with care, um, you know, things that are of different sizes that need to be handled separately or, or differently. Um, and that's just kind of the reality of, of the scenario is that um, we, have, we have services that uh, just need to be treated much, much differently than others. And there's just lots of different use cases that we have to satisfy. So, uh, so much like the, the back of the, the UPS van here, we, we have things that are of many different shapes and sizes. They're all mostly self-contained. and Some are a little bit leaky, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, but by and large, there, there is no one uniform parcel size that, that defines them all. Um, and what this, what this results in is we, on my team, we, we get a lot of different uh, feature requests. Uh, and it's, it, uh, it's, it's really hard to scrutinize these very carefully to you know, not just turn people down on things that might help them be more efficient in their work, but, uh, but we sort of have had to play this game of, of sort of saying no for a while until enough people ask for something similar so that we don't have sort of um, behaviors that are at odds with each other, uh, and also so that we don't create these traps that I was talking about. So what this results in is we, we have this really delicate balance of, um, of use cases and of features that we want to provide for updating software. And, uh, and to stretch this metaphor a little bit further, uh, the, on, on a per instance basis, uh, so like you know, I talked about the strategies for doing updates, and that's, that's part of the story, uh, but it's actually not the most complicated part of it. Um, and, and it's kind of nice that, uh, that the complexity, in my opinion, really lives down at a low level, but it's, the, the problems are still really at the very basics of updating an individual instance. Um, software is still really hard to write. Um, RPC clients and servers are still really hard to write. Uh, there's still plenty of problems with thundering herds and deadlocks and live locks. Um, and, and these are not necessarily widespread, but you know, when you get 1% of these and you have, you know, 1% of these issues happening every month and 2,000 engineers with hundreds of services, you feel like you're kind of fielding these, these uh, requirements and these problems continually. So what we're really trying to strive for is something that 
generally fits the use cases that we see and the ones that we want to support. Uh, and that's kind of just sort of guided by our best practices. But we want some balance between software and, and a platform that's easy to use but also highly flexible. Uh, that's very difficult. Uh, and we also want to strike a balance between requiring that our software at Twitter is all highly robust uh, and providing a smart platform that solves the common problems for all the different use cases that we have. Um, we're lucky at Twitter that we, you know, are, we're a, a self-contained institution, so we can define and, and sort of evangelize the best practices uh, for the Apache project that, that changes a little bit where it starts to make more sense to lean a little bit further down the, the smart platform side uh, so that we can help uh, a much more diverse set of software do things the right way. So, so getting into uh, yeah, that, that actually updating an individual instance uh, and, and the details behind that, there are, there are a few things that are just uh, sort of recurring problems with this. Um, and a lot of it comes down to delays and thresholds. Uh, I've, I've attended several talks uh, this, this session already, or the, yeah, the, this conference already, where uh, thresholds and you know, setting your timings right is, is sort of a, a key learning. And that continues to be the case um, because ultimately you're trying to strike a balance between responsiveness and um, and failure tolerance. So if if you if you can't get that right, it's it's really painful. Um, but yeah, you face delays like uh, actually fetching a package. Sometimes the service that you're fetching your binaries from becomes slow, or you know tail latency has been another common topic. Sometimes there's huge tail latency with with fetching packages, and this can have ripple effects into uh, impacting people trying to deploy software. Uh, a lot of applications have very complex startup procedures. Um, at, at Twitter, we're, we're largely a JVM shop, so there's, there's very real performance impacts and impacts to tail latency if certain services don't do a significant amount of, uh, of warm-up to the JVM to exercise those common code paths to get the JIT to run. Um, and, and they find that, you know, they're their four nines latency is considerably better when they do this. Um, and, and to facilitate that, we have applications that are doing things like receiving what we call dark traffic. So maybe these are our reads that really have no impact, but is, is exercising those code paths to, to get the application ready to a state where it's, uh, where it's able to receive live traffic at, at peak volume. Uh, we also, within Aurora, we implement health checks of services. So there's, there's lots of different ways that people want to, to handle health checks that want uh, Aurora to respond to health checks when they fail um, different numbers of, of uh, consecutive successful health checks. Um, you know, it pretty quickly starts to, to sound like a Turing complete machine if we, if we really accept all of the feature requests. So this is a case where we've had to push back quite, pretty significantly. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned the issues with in, in the software layer, um, there's, there's still very real problems with thundering herds. Uh, startup is a, is a case where we see that most frequently where a fresh new instance comes up and you know, if, if things are not uh, really prepared for that, you know, maybe there's a client somewhere that sees, oh, there's this new instance that I have zero outstanding requests to and I've got all these outstanding requests somewhere else, I'm just gonna go over there. And if everybody does that at the same time, that's a thundering herd. Uh, so you can pretty quickly get into cascading failures and failed deployments if you don't really anticipate that and, and build the robust software. Uh, as for, for tearing down, this is another really interesting part of the, the life cycle of an instance as well, um, where quite often people want the application to be able to quiesce any outstanding work that it has. Um, so that, that's sort of specifically in the case of an RPC server where uh, maybe there are, maybe there's like actually a, a real user on the other end of this connection uh, maybe they're doing. Maybe they're downloading their their tweet history, which um, you know has some amount of delay to it, and, and it might be a long-lived operation. Um, we want to we want to be able to do that gracefully. We don't want the user to to basically have the, the connection dropped and have a poor experience. So uh, ideally, we would we would totally wait out that operation and allow the the application to gracefully tear down. Uh, however, there's really large impacts to this. Uh, I was talking with somebody at uh, the, the social at Twitter, uh, the, the Twitter Seattle office the other day, and this, this topic came up of, you know, hey, I have this application that has connections that last as many, as, as long as three days, and I want to, I want to like gracefully close that out. Um, 
and that's something that's really, really hard for us to provide. You know, at the, the scale that we, that we operate at and the number of users that we have, it's pretty easy to make the wrong call and, and offer support for something like that. And as a result, our operations grind to a halt. And you know, then we can't do kernel upgrades at the rate that we would like to. So this goes back to the delicate balance. It's just really uh, hard but important to carefully scrutinize these feature requests and, and uh, make sure that we're, we're striking that balance between allowing our operations to proceed smoothly, but also allow the user to provide good service and, and uh, good uh, experience for the users. Um, so the, the way that we do this today in Aurora is uh, we, in our executor, we, we send HTTP signals. So when we want to tear down an instance, we're going to, there's a, a request that we make telling it that it, we're about to tear it down. Uh, we also do this with, uh, with signaling as well. But um, the, the standard approach is sending a quit, quit, quit request to the instance, um, allowing it to decide to tear down. Uh, but right now we have this, this fixed deadline. And that's actually an, uh, it's a blocker to some services to run in, uh, to, sorry, to, to move into Aurora. Because, you know, like I said, there's these user-facing concerns where we don't want to sever a connection that's active. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just something that's a difficult balance to strike and figure out where it makes sense to offer that support. Uh, another really big impact, of, if we were to do that, you know, if we, if we give the user a knob saying that they can choose you know, from 10 seconds to infinity how long to quiesce while tearing down, um, uh, there's, there's impacts on preemption. So Aurora supports preemption in that it will, uh, if there's important things that are running, or sorry, not running in the data center that we want to run, we want to provide guarantees around that, uh, we will go out and seek out sort of lower priority things that are actively holding up resources, and we'll steal those re resources back so that they, the important things can run. But that, that has a pretty big impact if uh, basically somebody can hold an instance hostage, hostage by, uh, by trying to quiesce all, any outstanding work that it has. And tearing down is another, another case. Like, by and large, when people are, are writing software, you're, you're mostly thinking about the steady state case. Um, because that's uh, just generally easiest to think about, and it's, it's the, the state that your application is in for the longest amount of time. Uh, but during that teardown phase, uh, that's when we, we tend to see most commonly deadlocks and live locks where you know, there's some failure to, to synchronize or coordinate properly during a teardown phase, and you have an instance that's just sort of hung. So that plays pretty poorly with giving that knob to, to teardown time. Uh, so that's another reason why it's a little bit risky to expose those types of things. Um, you've, you've probably used canaries in some fashion before. Uh, we, we consider this a best practice where you have some instance, uh, maybe a single instance of your service when you're doing a deploy. You're going to, to deploy this one first. You're going to watch it more carefully than you do the rest of them. And it's sort of just an early indicator of warnings. Uh, so canary in the coal mine is the metaphor there that, that we tend to use in the industry. Um, and this is really good. Um, we have a couple of ways that we support this in Aurora. Um, but one of the, the impacts of this uh, is there, are, again, with the many definitions, there's many de different definitions of canary. Sometimes it's one instance. Sometimes it's five. Sometimes it's an entirely different job. Um, sometimes a canary lasts for two seconds. Sometimes they last actually for days. So again, this has, this has impacts to the, the tooling that we build uh, because we can't make assumptions around really anything. Uh, the only thing that we did learn with, with canaries and the, and the way people want to do them uh, is that we really need to support heterogeneous jobs. Uh, this is one thing that we were kind of opposed to for a long time. Uh, it's a lot easier to think about services if all of the instances are at least converging towards uh, homogeneity. Um, when, they're, when they're heterogeneous, there's, uh, there's just there's more complexity, there's more cognitive overhead, but uh, sort of Popular, by popular demand, we ended up sort of more formally supporting heterogeneous jobs so that people can actually uh, slice and dice up their service. They can have different, uh, different instances running different software, different configuration, um, all sorts of different things. And one of the big things that we've worked on over the last year uh, is sort of swapping out the engine internally to Aurora that we use to implement updates. Historically, we, we basically broke up the way this worked uh, to a nice abstraction where uh, the, the client could fully orchestrate the update. 
And we were really proud of ourselves because this made for really nice boxes and lines. Um, but the, the, the impact of that was that we were able to, or we were not able to offer really good service around updates. Um, it meant a couple of things that meant that the client itself was much more complicated, um, both, both to implement and debug, um, but also the users actually using the client were impacted by this negatively, where you know we were sort of designing this around the idea that yeah, an update is probably going to last you know half hour, maybe a couple of hours. And as I mentioned, sometimes updates last days, um, and in some cases, people were actually aligning their workday around doing a slice of their their uh, their service to update. And like the, again, the delay there is really nothing to. Uh, and nothing about Aurora and, and its ability to do updates. It's just that that's the level of sensitivity that they were dealing with uh, for whatever reason in their service, and we can't really tell them otherwise. Uh, so that's, that's kind of really unfortunate if people are, like you literally have somebody with a client, their, their laptop open and connected, and essentially babysitting an update uh, for the entire workday. It's a huge productivity drain, um, especially if you have things like lost connections where the whole thing stops and you didn't realize until later that it wasn't operating for four hours. Uh, another really big issue with that was um, because the, the, the client became complicated, it really raised the barrier to entry for alternative client implementations, uh, which is something we, we don't really uh, offer well today, but we really want to support that. So it's really important for us to make it as simple as possible to, to write alternative clients and, and interact with Aurora as an API rather than uh, something that you can only use via command line. Uh, another thing, we find ourselves often wanting to use the, the fact that a deploy is in flight as a, a signal for scheduling. And if the scheduler is ignorant of, de of deploys and updates, it's really hard to do. Uh, so, so we realized that we, we really needed to push this complexity down, push it into the scheduler. Um, we could have done it in a different layer, but we opted for, for, uh, for fewer moving parts. and. Uh, and yeah, we basically pushed it, pushed it into the scheduler, uh, and the result was we were able to provide new UIs. Uh, it was significantly faster to do updates, uh, and it's significantly more reliable. Uh, so this is uh, the, the sort of the meat of the API that we have today. Uh, there's really nothing groundbreaking here. You can start, pause, resume, and abort an update. And the last one there is kind of interesting, which is uh, pause, or sorry, pulse. Um, so I'll get into that in a little bit. What that's for. Uh, and the actual requests are pretty straightforward. Uh, there's the, the instruction for what an instance looks like, uh, the number of them to, to have copies, and then the settings for controlling the update. Uh, so the settings, basically, that, that's ballooned into a number of knobs, and this sort of is a manifestation of all of the different use cases that we have. Um, but we basically have a, a group of flags in here that are for the, uh, uh, the velocity of the update a group that's for the failure tolerance of the update, and then finally a way to scope the update. Uh, so this is how you can do the, the heterogeneous jobs. Uh, you can basically slice and dice the job up any way you want. You can do canaries, you can do multi-phase canary, you can do a staggered deploy, um, however you see fit. Uh, and then we have a mechanism to allow you to block for a lack of pulses. And again, I'll get into that briefly. Um, so this is, I'm just going to do a really quick run through of the, the UI that we were able to add. So we have now a, like a global view of updates that are in progress. This is really awesome. We have a team that essentially operates uh, with a knock so they can quickly see like if their site impact, they can go and look at what's changed uh, and at least rule things out. Uh, but, but quite often they'll find things that updated recently. When looking at a job, you can see the actual progress. You can see details on who started the update. So you can go and you know, go yell at them if they are, they're breaking something horribly. Uh, and you can also see history of, of the, the iterations of the software. Uh, and I think it, it's pretty likely that in the future we're going to extend this to, to support things like point in time rollbacks. Uh, whoa. Uh, so th this, this next one is basically. Oh, I don't know. Well, that one didn't matter. <laughs> uh, so, anyway, we're also able to do some really interesting data uh, collection now. So I really quickly gathered some kind of like inconsequential data on frequency of deploys over the last 90 days. Uh, the red bars on top are rollbacks. I was really hoping I'd find some cool correlation between day of week and, and success rate. Unfortunately, I didn't. But it's just kind of cool. You can very clearly see weekends, which there's still a lot of deploys happening on weekends. Many of them are likely automated. Um, and then you can see three-day weekends where 
uh, like July 4th, there were three days in a row, it looked like a weekend. Uh, grouping that by hour, it's, it's kind of neat too. You can very clearly see business hours. You can see uh, apparently Twitter has pretty good lunch because people stop deploying and they go to lunch. Uh, and then there's, there's a couple of outliers there which I thought were kind of cool, but uh, it turns out it's just some people have some scheduled automated deploys and uh, a very large number of them apparently. Oh, and again, I was hoping for some correlation saying like 3 a.m. deploy, well actually, I was hoping to see that really late night deploys were always flawed or, or more likely to fail, but as it turns out, there was really no correlation. However, 3 a.m., there were no rollbacks. So if you want to deploy, 3 a.m. seems to be the time to do it. I don't know if there's a bomber peak reference there, maybe. Um, so, so for the layers that we've built on top of this, um, we've, we built a system called our deploy orchestration service. Uh, so DOS was the obvious uh, uh, yeah, word to use for that, so that we call this DOS. Uh, it basically allows us to centralize policy. So we have some different things that, um, that this, this thing advertises to and consumes signal from when we're in the course of an update. And this is basically where we use that pulse. Uh, so what, what the client's going to do is it's going to announce to DOS that, there's, that it's just submitted an update. DOS is going to monitor that with our alert system so that it can automatically pause. Uh, and this has been really huge so that people can uh, sort of have some extra uh, fault tolerance to their updates and some automated safeguards. Um, so to take that a step further, one of the big major uh, big issues that we've had is uh, just more cases where operator error can crop up. Uh, so everything that you've seen so far is all about updating within the scope of an individual cluster. But in reality, our deploys span multiple clusters. They span multiple different environments. Um, so we ended up having lots of people that still have wiki pages and checklists for, for doing deploys, and a lot of it was still manual. Uh, and there's lots of room for, for errors there. People would be accidentally deploying the wrong software or having mixed versions across different clusters. Uh, so what we decided to do is build a tool called Workflows, which you probably can't see all that well from the back, but um, basically this gives us a, a sort of a serialized definition of what, an, what a, a global deploy means and, and how we do that. Uh, and there's some, some other interesting UIs there. Uh, I can show these later if, if anybody's interested in, but it's all a prototype at this point. Uh, so, but one of the most important things that I want to bring up, and this goes back to the um, path of least resistance, uh, updates uh, and, and tooling in general can become a trap. So it's really important to avoid building traps. Um, I'm almost out of time, but there's a, there's a quick story I wanted to give where uh, we, act, we had a user that accidentally killed their entire service globally. And the reaction to that was my team being told, we need a manifest of jobs that can never be killed. Um, you, you might guess where that went. Um, about three months later, it turns out they really needed to kill that job. Uh, so we ended up with a HAL 9000. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave, um, which was not good. And so in turn, we, we, were, we were then told that uh, we must be able to kill jobs. Uh, so. So yeah, the, the learning there was we, we caved and we dulled our tool. Uh, we really shouldn't have done that. Um, so we ended up sharpening the tool back up. Uh, so that, that manifest of jobs is now gone. Uh, now just parting words. So similar to the previous slide, uh, it's really important when you build tooling that you build safeguards, you make your tools sharp and safe, but uh, you should also plan the way out. Plan the escape hatch, let the user make their own judgment call, let, let them decide if they want to go down into the basement. Uh, let, let them decide if, if the situation calls for breaking the glass and, uh, and doing something that's different. Uh, and, and the way that you can do that most effectively is to make sure that when that escape hatch is open or when that, when that glass is broken, there's an alarm that's sounded so that you can actually understand why that happened. Uh, so that's, that's all I have for talk content. Um, Thank you all for coming. This is, uh, this is a really fun talk to put together. This is a lot of work that we've, we've spent over the last year. Um, I think I'm pretty much up on time, so, uh, so I'll be happy to take maybe one quick question, but feel free to come by the Twitter booth after, and, uh, and I'm happy to answer any more questions that you have. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, so the question is how do we manage deploys of software that is stateful, uh, such as something that might have to do a, a database migration? Um, let's, talk, let's talk after. That one's probably too, too complicated for me to answer quickly and give the, uh, you know, keep on schedule. Um, but anyway, yeah, thanks again for the time, um, and, and thanks again for showing up. I hope this is interesting. Uh, and again, feel free to come by the Twitter booth after. Uh, there's plenty of people that can answer questions about this.